Welcome to today's program, the connection between wage and hour and restrictive covenant law. Copies of the slides, a link to the recording, and the CLE verification form will be emailed to you in the days following the webinar. During the program, a CLE code will be read aloud, and you will be required to include this code on the CLE form. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box on your screen. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Kevin Young. Thank you so much, and, and thank you all for being here with us today on our presentation concerning the connection between two areas of law that matter a lot uh, to us because they matter a lot to our clients, to the businesses we represent. Uh, one is the area that employers remain uh, more likely to get sued on than any other employment uh, law issue, which is wage and hour law. And the other is an area that is oftentimes most important uh, to businesses and employers in safeguarding their business and their business assets, and that's restrictive covenants. Uh, before we go further, we want to provide a quick legal disclaimer. We'll do it on the next slide. So our, our, our lawyers require us to tell you that uh, the things we say in this presentation are not legal advice. Uh, this is all for information purposes. Uh, we don't want you to construe this as legal advice or an opinion. If you need legal advice on a particular situation that you or your business are facing, uh, certainly feel free to reach out to us or to a lawyer of your choice. Relatedly, um, we will love to have questions today, and we're going to try to answer as many as we can, particularly at the end of the presentation. But again, we don't want to get into opining on specific situations concerning you or your business. So two words that, that go, to what, go together very well and that we like a lot are hypothetically speaking. So hypothetically speaking questions are invited, um, and we hope that you'll feel free to, to enter them into the chat as we go. Uh, next slide, please. So quick introductions. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Young. Uh, I'm a partner in Cypress Shaw's Labor and Employment uh, Department, and I'm based out of the firm's Atlanta office. I was based out of my house for the last year, but I'm finally back in the office and happy to be here. Uh, without really intending to, I have spent the majority of my time over the past decade or so advising and defending employers on matters relating to wage and hour law. Everything from exempt and non-exempt classification, uh, overtime and minimum wage, uh, determining hours work, uh, independent contractor issues, and then what's really become the, the latest rage in, in, in wage and hour law, uh, work from home uh, practices and, and issues stemming from that. I'm joined today by my Atlanta colleagues, Dan Hart and Carrie Burke. Uh, Dan is a partner in our Atlanta office. His practice spans employment and commercial litigation disputes involving trade secrets, restrictive covenants, and single plaintiff or multi plaintiff uh, lawsuits that involve workplace discrimination, harassment, and other employment related claims. Dan is a go to not just for, for us here in the Atlanta office, but really for attorneys throughout the firm on restrictive covenant issues of all shapes sizes and, and, and levels of severity. Last but not least, we're joined by Carrie Burke, an attorney in our Atlanta office who really bridges the gap between what Dan does and what I do. Uh, Carrie has immense experience defending and counseling businesses, uh, both in the, in, in, in the wage and hour arena and also on restrictive covenant issues. Uh, next slide, please. So we wanted to provide a quick overview of, of where this presentation going today. Uh, we'll start with an introduction, giving some flavor for you know, what this topic is and, 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 and why we're talking about it. Um, we'll then get a little bit deeper into you know, what's this overlap that we wanted to talk about between these two really important areas of the law, between wage and hour law and then restrictive covenant. From there, we're going to try to make this as practical as possible. We want to talk about you know, what does this mean for you and your business, and then how do you manage some of the risks that we'll be, we'll be covering today. Uh, given Carrie's experience really bridging the gap or bridging the expanse between these two areas of the law, we thought he would be a great MC or director for, for today's presentation. So with that, I'll turn it to Carrie to keep us going. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, next slide, please. So as Kevin mentioned briefly at the start, um, and as I think a lot of y'all have recognized on this call, wage and hour lawsuits uh, are the ever-expanding problem for our employers. Uh, they continue to be really the most prevalent type of employment li uh, related litigation. And we're also in an age where information is at our fingertips. And not only that, it's more valuable and easier to disseminate or transfer than ever. Uh, and with that, you know, restrictive covenants remain at the forefront of many employers' business goals. And so while it may not be obvious at first blush, these two forces, 
the uh, the ever present wage and hour lawsuit threat, and the increasingly thorny restrictive covenant law, particularly uh, with differences between states, have the potential to run headlong into one another. Uh, wage and hour risks can feed into restrictive covenant risks, and and vice versa. Um, next slide. And so let's talk a little bit about where these forces truly converge. Um, to kick our discussion off, I'll throw it over to Dan as a restrictive covenants litigator. Dan, where do you see the biggest area of interplay between wage and hour law and restrictive covenants law? Well, thanks, Kerry. Uh, I really see two big areas of interplay between wage and hour law and restrictive covenant law uh, on the restricted covenant side. And the first area of overlap that I see involves state laws on non-competes that borrow from federal or state wage and hour law when defining the types of workers who can be required to sign non-competes. And there's really two different kinds of statutes that I'm thinking of. The first are statutes that require that workers have to be exempt under the FLSA or state wage and hour law in order to be bound by non-competes or that require that employees perform certain types of duties that are normally the duties that would be associated with exempt employees under wage and hour law. The other type of statute that I have in mind um, is a, are statutes that impose some sort of compensation threshold that workers have to be able to meet in order for a company to be able to bind those workers to a non-compete. And I'm using the term worker here intentionally instead of employee because these statutes sometimes apply both to employees and to independent contractors, which raises its own significant issues for, for companies. The second area of overlap that I see between wage and hour law and restrictive covenant law uh, is in, in mitigating risk. Usually the types of issues that drive restricted covenant litigation are different from the kind of issues that drive wage and hour litigation. And sometimes those interests can be in tension. You know, typically in a restricted covenant case, a company is probably the plaintiff seeking to enforce its own non-competes. In contrast, in a restricted covenant case, they're on the defense. Um, when you're drafting and enforcing restrictive covenants, uh, as a company, I think it's important to keep the big picture in mind and understand that there are certain wage and hour considerations that might be overlooked if you're only looking at things within the lens of the, the restricted covenant case and vice versa. There are restricted covenant issues that should be kept in mind uh, when you are rolling out policies for wage and hour consideration and you might miss those if you're just looking at things solely from a wage and hour lens. So it's important to keep both of those considerations in mind. Thanks for that, Dan. Um, Kevin, turning it to you, where do you see the biggest areas of overlap here? Yeah, you know, I, I, I'd echo Dan's first point. You know, a lot of the restrictive covenant laws that we're seeing at the state level and, and which we're gonna run through uh, to some extent as we move forward, look to the FLSA, to the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the federal wage and hour law, or at least borrow its language heavily in defining who may be covered by a restrictive covenant or a non-compete agreement. Um, and, and, and so, so you, you end up, you start in a restrictive covenant statute, but you end up having to look at these definitions that are out there for wage and hour purposes. Beyond what Dan mentioned, the only thing I, I'd say is, is that what, 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 what ends up happening on either front, whether on the restrictive covenant front or on the wage and hour front, when you're dealing with these definitions, is it puts a lot of onus and burden on an employer to know what its employees are doing. If you're in a restrictive covenant type of case where, you know, where the state law says, well, this can only be signed by exempt employees or by executives, it's really the, the onus in, in enforcing that sort of promise of whether you know, with litigation or without it is on the employer to show well, this worker was doing something that fits within the, the contours of what the statute provides. It's also on an employer in that in, in in looking at an employee and what they do in the event of a wage and hour lawsuit, where an employee might say, "Well, I was misclassified as exempt." Um, you know, generally speaking, the employer has the burden to prove an exemption, and so it's important for an employer to know and to be able to demonstrate 
well, what this employee was doing, who's now challenging his or her classification, fits within the contours of an exemption provided by federal or state wage and hour law. So to really sum that up, I, I think you, the only point I'd add to what Dan said is that in either event, whether it's restrictive, restrictive covenant litigation or wage and hour litigation, it's really incumbent on a business to know and, and, and to be able to demonstrate what it is that its workers are doing to either justify the application of the restrictive covenant agreement or to justify the application of an exemption. Thanks for that, Kevin. Um, next slide, please. And I think that's a great segue in, into our next section here. Um, Dan, I think you mentioned previously that some states have statutes requiring that workers have to be exempt either under the Fair Labor Standards Act or the corresponding state wage and hour law to be bound by a non-compete or that they have to perform certain types of duties to be bound by these non-competes. In what states is that the case? Well, for those who are following along um, with the slideshow, you can see the slide on the screen has a map of the U.S. and it has states highlighted uh, where this is the case. And as you can see, if you have workers in Georgia, Idaho, Massachusetts, Oregon, Rhode Island, or Virginia, you should be aware of these laws before rolling out or seeking to enforce non-competes in these states. Okay, so let's let's walk through those requirements in these states, and let's start right here in Georgia. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, Dan, we know that in many states, non-competes are getting harder to enforce, but here in Georgia, the law appears to be pretty favorable to employers. What, what makes Georgia notable? Now, Georgia has been an exception uh, in that the trend throughout the country has been to make it harder to enforce non-competes. About 10 years ago in 2011, the Georgia legislature bucked the trend by passing a new restricted covenant statute that made Georgia change from being one of the most difficult states in the country to enforce non-competes to now being one of the most pro-employer states when it comes to enforcing non-competes. But uh, even under the Georgia statute, which 10 years later we're still calling the new law, uh, not all employees can be subjected to a true non-compete. Uh, for those who are interested, the new law, 10-year-old um, new law, is, is, is found at OCGA 13-8-50 uh, and the subsequent code sections. And the statute does an interesting thing. It, it provides that with respect to true non-competes, as opposed to a non-solicit or a non-disclosure agreement, those kind of covenants that keep somebody from working in a period for a period of time in a certain geography performing certain competitive duties that those can only be enforced against either employees or independent contractors if they fall within one of of several different groups listed out in the statute and the first group uh, is workers that customarily and regularly solicit for the employer customers or prospective customers. And I should note here with respect to all of these definitions, these apply equally to employees or independent contractors. The second group is workers who customarily and regularly engage in making sales or obtaining orders or contracts, for products or services to be performed by others. So not just the, the frontline client facing salespeople, but also those who are supporting salespeople with respect to placing orders. The, the third group, and I think this is very interesting for this discussion, uh, are workers who perform duties that in the definition match verbatim the definition of the executive exemption under the FLSA. So for those of you who are familiar with the FLSA's white collar exemptions, the three most prominent ones are the executive, the administrative, and the professional exemption. And the language that the Georgia legislature adopted is verbatim from the FLSA's executive exemption. Uh, another group uh, of people who can be bound by non-competes are uh, workers who, who classify as quote unquote key employee. And that's a bit of a misnomer because the employee could, could be an independent contractor under the Georgia statute. And that means an employee or, or independent contractor who, by reason of the worker's investment of time, training, money, trust, exposure to the public, 
or exposure to customers, vendors, or other business relationships during the course of the, the statute says employees employment with the employer, although again, that covers independent contractors, has gained a high level of notoriety, fame, reputation, or public persona as the employer's representative or spokesperson, or has gained a high level of influence or credibility with the employer's customers, vendors, or other business relationships, or is intimately involved in the planning for or direction of the business of the employer, or a defined unit of the business of the employer. That's a, a mouthful. It really is a, a, a catch-all that's going to cover a lot of workers who wouldn't fall within one of the other definitions. Uh, and the last group of workers who can be bound by a non-compete uh, under the Georgia statute are uh, folks who perform the duties of a professional, which is an employee who has as a primary duty the performance of work requiring knowledge of an advanced type in a field of science or learning customarily acquired by a prolonged course of specialized intellectual instruction or requiring invention, imagination, originality, or talent in a recognized field of artistic or creative endeavor. That's a bit of a, of a mouthful too, but for those who are familiar with the FLSA's professional exemption, that tracks very closely the language of the FLSA as to professional um, uh, folks who are properly classified as exempt under the professional exemption. So these are five different categories. Employees or, or workers have to fit within one of these five categories in order to be subject to a non-compete agreement. Uh, I should note that these definitions are pretty broad, as you can tell by the two that I've read out or quoted. In most circumstances, uh, I think an employer will be able to show that one of these definitions apply with respect to any employees who are properly classified as exempt, but the employer still has to show that the definition applies. And I'm sure there are some situations where somebody could be classified as exempt that isn't going to fall within one of these uh, five categories. So that is the Georgia law on this issue. Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, let's let's talk about uh, uh, Idaho a little bit. How does Idaho law apply here, Dan? Idaho has an interesting statute, uh, somewhat similar to the the Georgia statute we just talked about, that limits non competes so that they can only be um, used against employees or independent contractors who are quote unquote key employees or key independent contractors. Uh, and again, there's a statutory definition of that. Those are defined as those employees or independent contractors who, by reason of the employer's investment of time, money, trust, exposure to the public, or exposure to technologies, intellectual property, business plans, business processes, and methods of operation, customers, vendors, or other business relationships during the course of employment, have gained a high level of inside knowledge influence, credibility, notoriety, fame, reputation, or public persona as a representative or spokesperson of the employer, and as a result, have the ability to harm or threaten an employer's legitimate business interests. Now, again, that's a, that's a mouthful. Uh, for those who are interested in the citation, that's in Idaho statutes 44-2701 to 2704. So in, in Idaho, whether someone's an independent contractor or an employee, they have to fit within that definition of key employee or key independent contractor. You know, again, a lot of folks who are properly classified as exempt under the FLSA, I think probably will fall within that definition. But that's not always the case. And so if you're going to try to support a non-compete against those kind of workers, you're going to have to make sure that they fall within that definition of key employee or key independent contractor. And if I may, really quickly before you go, Carrie, you know, because this Idaho statute that, that Dan just ran through, I think one key point to take away is that an employee or a contractor who's trying to resist application or the enforcement of a non compete that he or she may have signed under the statute, in some cases, among other things, might argue, well, I wasn't that important. I wasn't a key employee. I was, I was menial. You know, I wasn't that integral to the process. You didn't 
yeah, I wasn't in the loop on anything that looks like a trade secret. I wasn't held out in any sort of way that I was, you know, the face of the business for anything uh, or on any sensitive matters. And when they're doing those sorts of things to try to resist the application of the, the, the restrictive covenant statute, of the non-compete statute, these are also the same tropes that we hear when we hear an exempt employee say, I was misclassified. Yeah, I got a salary. I get it. But because of my duties, I was, you know, the, the phrase we hear all the time is I was, I was a glorified hourly associate. You know, that, that's like a phrase we hear in all these cases where someone says, Look, yeah, you, you got the salary part of being an exempt employee, right? But the duties piece, which is also necessary to support most exemptions, wasn't there because I was menial. It's the same sort of argument that you hear on both sides. That's a great point, Kevin. Yeah, really, really great point there, Kevin. Um, next slide, please. Dan, tell us a little bit about Massachusetts, if you would. Sure. So the Massachusetts legislature passed a new statute a couple years ago, um, codified at MGLA 149, Section 24L. That statute really changed the law on non-competes in the Bay State. Um, I, I don't think we have time to go over everything that the law did. But for purposes of our discussion, I think one of the most significant changes is that Unlike prior law in Massachusetts, which was governed by common law, uh, now as a matter of statute, the law prohibits employers from entering into a true non-compete agreement with any non-exempt employees under the FLSA, as well as any employees under age 18, paid or unpaid student interns, or other short-term student employees who are enrolled in school. And so this is a great example of a state statute uh, expressly referencing the FLSA in laying out who can be bound by a non-compete agreement. Great, thanks, Dan. Next slide, please. Um, let's move on and, and touch briefly on Oregon. What's, what's the law in Oregon, Dan? Yeah, Oregon has a comprehensive statute, um, which is found at Oregon Revised Statute 653.295, which has been on the books for a while and, and has been uh, a, a very heavily litigated statute over the years. And that applies to non-competes, to non-compete agreements, as again, as opposed to non-solicits or non-disclosure covenants. And under that statute, a non-compete covenant is voidable, not void, but voidable, unless the employers notify the employee in a written employment offer received by the employee at least two weeks before the first day of employment that a non-compete is required as a condition of employment, or it's entered into upon a subsequent bona fide advancement of the employee by the employer. So that's one requirement. The second requirement is that the employer has to have a protectable interest, such as trade secrets or competitively sensitive confidential business or professional information. Uh, that's the standard anyway in the common law. But then third, and this is important for purposes of our discussion, the employee has to be exempt from the overtime requirements of Oregon wage and hour law under the administrative, executive, or professional exemptions which are laid out in ORS section 653.020 subsection three. That is part of the Oregon wage and hour statute. So they have to have those that proper exemption. And such a person has to receive annualized compensation at the time of termination that exceeds the median income of a four person family as determined by the U.S. Census Bureau for the most recent year available at the time of the employee's termination. And under, under current numbers, that amount is about $99,000 and change per year. So, you know, very interesting from a wage and hour and restricted covenant perspective, not only does the employee have to be exempt under one of those three state law exemptions, professional, executive, uh, or administrative exemption, they also have to receive compensation that is at or in excess of this minimum compensation threshold. Great. Uh, next slide, please. So we are going back to the East Coast. Uh, next on our list is Rhode Island. Um, the law is pretty new there. Is that right, Dan? 
That's right. It, it went into effect uh, January 15th of 2020. It's now codified at Rhode Island statute section 28-59-1 at Sequentia. Under that statute, similar to what we've seen in other states, non-competes are not enforceable against any employee who is classified as non-exempt under the FLSA. So if they're not exempt under the FLSA, automatically you can't enforce a non-compete against them. Also, they can't be enforced against undergraduate or graduate students who participate in an internship or otherwise enter into a short-term employment relationship with the employer. Uh, they can apply to employees who are 18 or younger. And finally, they, can apply, they can't apply to a quote-unquote low-wage employee, which is defined as an employee whose average annual earnings are not more than 250% of the federal poverty level for individuals as established by the Department of Health and Human Services uh, under their federal poverty guidelines. Currently, that number is a little shy of $32,000 a year. It's $31,290 per year. So not only does somebody have to be properly classified as exempt, they also have to make that minimum compensation for them to be bound by a non-compete. Now, I think it's interesting to consider how this number interacts with the, the minimum salary that people have to be paid, uh, at least under some exemptions of the FLSA, in order to be properly classified as exempt. Kevin, are, th are there any people who are properly classified as exempt under the FLSA who would not make this minimum compensation threshold? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So generally speaking, you know, and again, as Dan mentioned before, the core exemption to the federal wage and hour laws, overtime and minimum wage requirements are referred to as the white collar exemptions or the executive, administrative, and professional exemptions. Those exemptions for the most part carry a salary, a salary level that's 680 and change. I think it's 684 per week uh, is, is the minimum salary for an executive, administrative, or professional employee to be classified as exempt. That nets out to about $35,000 a year, give or take, which is more than this minimum that Dan mentioned in Rhode Island. So you know, by virtue of, of properly classifying an executive, administrative, or professional exempt employee in Rhode Island, by, by paying them at least a 35K, you're going to be above this 31k threshold that's set that's set under the Rhode Island statute. But one exception to that, a, another very common exemption that, that employers use, is known as the outside sales exemption, and is exactly what it sounds like. That exemption is for individuals who are customarily and regularly outside of the business, outside of the home, making sales on behalf of the employer. There's no salary requirement for that one exemption. For that one exemption, in fact, there's no compensation level requirement. You can pay an outside sales employee as long as they're performing the right duties on any basis you, you want, and there's no uh, minimum uh, salary or annual earnings level. So it's certainly possible that you could have someone in a state like Rhode Island where, uh, where, where there could be this disconnect, where you could have someone who's a properly classified outside sales employee who's not earning at least 31k maybe it's, it's, it's that that you know they had a down year or something like that and that causes some friction with this rhode island requirement got it thanks kevin next, next slide please um dan to wrap up this portion of the list we've got virginia can you tell us a little bit about virginia sure so the virginia statute just went into effect july 1st of last year uh, it's codified at Virginia Code Section 40.1-28.7-8. That's a, a mouthful. Uh, under that statute, uh, no employer is permitted to enter into, enforce, or threaten to enforce a covenant not to compete with any low-wage employee. And a low-wage employee is defined as an employee whose average week weekly earnings are less than the average weekly wage of the Commonwealth of Virginia as determined pursuant to uh, Virginia law, which is at this point about $1,233 per week, uh, according to current data. So that nets out to you know, well over $55,000 a year. Uh, 
low wage workers also include interns, students, apprentices, or trainees employed with or without pay at a trade or occupation in order to gain work or educational experience. It includes an individual who has independently contracted with another person to perform services independent of an employment relationship and who's compensated for such services at an hourly rate that's less than uh, the median hourly wage for the Commonwealth that we just talked about. Uh, low wage employee doesn't include any employee whose earnings are derived in whole or in predominant part from sales commissions, incentives, or bonuses paid to, paid to the employee uh, by the employer. Got it. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, next slide, please. So let's move on and talk about the other category of state statutes that overlap with wage and hour law. Uh, can you tell us about those? Sure. So we've already touched on some of these. Um, we, we already talked about Oregon, Rhode Island, and Virginia. Uh, again, as a reminder, in Oregon, the, the current number is about $99,000 per year in annual compensation, although that number can change every year because it's tied to the median income of a four-person family under the U.S. Census Bureau numbers. In Rhode Island, it's annual earnings more than 250% of the federal poverty level. That's roughly $31,000 and change per year. And then in Virginia, as we just looked at, it's uh, $1,233 per week currently although that number changes, which equates to about, I think, 64 and some change annually. So, you know, pretty pretty wide range in the compensation. A lot of other states have recently joined this trend. They include Illinois, Maine, Maryland, New Hampshire, and Washington. Got it. Well, next slide, please. So let's start with Illinois then. Um, what does the law look like in Illinois right now? Yeah, Illinois has a statute called the Freedom to Work Act that first was implemented or uh, enacted in 2016. And that does a very similar thing to some of these other statutes. It bans non-competes for low-wage workers, which are workers defined in Illinois to be non-governmental workers making less than the greater of the prevailing federal, state, or local minimum wage, or $13 per hour. That's codified for those who are interested at 820 ILCS 90. Um, forward slash one. I should note that you know $13 per hour is a pretty low number. There's not a statutory penalty for an employer in Illinois to attempt to enforce a non-compete with respect to people who make less than that amount. But even before the statute was passed, the Attorney General of Illinois led the country in filing suits against employers that required low wage employees to sign non competes as a condition of employment. Even people signing, you know, non competes who are making $13 an hour, which at least under the statute is theoretically permissible. And what the Illinois Attorney General uh, was basing these suits on is the theory that having non competes with low wage workers has an anti competitive effect on the marketplace and it violates state fair competition laws. And so um, there remains a considerable risk for employers in Illinois if they're trying to have uh, employees who are low wage workers sign non competes. And so, even if you have somebody who's on the edge, $13, $14, $15 an hour, I would think very carefully about requiring those kind of employees to sign a non compete, um, given the risk in Illinois. Uh, next slide, please. Seems seems risky for sure. So next up on our list is Maine. Can you talk a little bit about Maine law? Sure. Maine does a very similar thing to some of the other New England states that we've seen. They ban non-competes for employees who earn wages uh, at or below 400% of the federal poverty level. Under current numbers, that's about 51,000 and change per year. But as with some of the other statutes we've talked about, that could change every year because the numbers change as the federal poverty level changes. Got it. Next slide, please. I'm uh, moving on to the next state, which is Maryland. W what does Maryland law do here? Maryland also has a relatively recent statute uh, passed, I think, last year. It's at Maryland Labor and Employment Section 3-71, and that bans non-compete agreements um, for any employees earning less than $15 per hour uh, 
or $31,200 annually. Um, as with Illinois, I should note, if you have a worker who's right at the, you know, the threshold of $15 an hour, um, I think I would still think long and hard about whether you really have somebody sign a non-compete in Maryland who is making that low compensation um, for all the reasons we talked about. Got it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, next up is New Hampshire. Can you tell us a little bit about New Hampshire? Yeah, New Hampshire employees, um, employers can't require employees to sign a non-compete if the employee makes less than or equal to 200% of the federal minimum wage. So that's 14.50 per hour, I believe. Kevin, correct me if I'm wrong on that number. Uh, in other words, they have to meet that minimum compensation in order to have a non-compete bound uh, binding them. As with everything else we've talked about, if folks are sort of on the line, just over the threshold comp uh, compensation threshold, again, I would I would think long and hard about whether you can really justify a non-compete for people making fifteen dollars an hour. Got it. Uh, next slide, please. And we're going back across the West Coast to the last state on our list, which is Washington. Um, tell us a little bit about Washington, please. Sure. Washington has a statute also that went into effect the last couple of years. It does a lot of different things. Um, I think many of which are beyond the scope of our discussion today. But for purposes of our presentation today, it prohibits non-competes. Again, not solicits, non non solicits, not non disclosures, but true non compete agreements for employees who make less than a hundred thousand dollars a year in total compensation, or against independent contractors who make less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year in total compensation. So very clear lines. Uh, you know, if you don't, um, as an employee meet that compensation threshold, um, the employer is not going to be able to, to enforce a non-compete against an employee or independent contractor. I should note one interesting thing, that there's a requirement in the statute of notifying employees or independent contractors that even if the agreement is not enforceable against them at the time of hiring, it could become enforceable against them in the future if their compensation increases. So uh, theoretically, somebody could be hired making $90,000 a year. Um, they remain employed by the company for two years. At the end of the second year, at that point, they're making over $100,000 per year in annual compensation, and the agreement would be enforceable against them so long as this, the employer has included this language, this notice language uh, in the agreement. One, one other important note here, just with respect to penalties and risks, this statute creates a private right of action uh, for a violation of the statute uh, and it authorized as an award of actual dam damages or a statutory penalty of $5,000 plus a reasonable attorney's fees, expenses and costs incurred by an employee or an independent contractor. So, uh, you know, again, there's some real teeth here. Um, if employers are trying to enforce a non-compete against a worker uh, under the statute where that worker cannot be bound by a non-compete. And, and if I could just mention one other thing here, we've been talking about states that have statutes that allow non-competes, but carve out certain types of employees who can't be bound by them. We're not talking today about states that don't in, uh, enforce non-competes at all. There are some in the country I think California is the most notable. Um, you know, be aware that in California and in some other states, you generally can't have a non-compete in in the context of employment with anybody, regardless of how they're classified and regardless of how much they're paid. So, if, if we haven't talked about a state today, uh, don't assume that that's a state where you can enforce a non-compete. It might be one of the states that that don't enforce them, regardless. Got it. So before moving on to the next section here, I wanted to um, make sure that we got the CLE code in. Um, the code will be required on your CLE verification form, and the code is SS2291. That's S as in Seiparth, S as in Shaw, 2291. Okay, next slide, please. So 
let's transition and talk a little bit about what this means for our businesses. This is an increasingly tricky tapestry that continues to get more um, full of risk as years go on, as we've seen with all of these new state laws. So Kevin, turning to you first, what do you see as the practical risks of all that we just discussed from a wage and hour perspective? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think it's the question that, that uh, folks who are interested in the topic came here to hear answered and hear discussion on. I think it's it, 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 it's important, it's subtle, but but it's, it's, it's got real consequences. Um, we do not, the purpose of going through this day is we're not gonna quiz anyone on all the states that we just went through, so you, you can breathe easy and rest easy on, on that. But if nothing else, hopefully it became clear that there's a lot of overlap with the wage and hour exemptions and these restrictive covenant laws. As Dan and Carrie walk through, some of the overlap is expressed, you know, with, with state uh, state laws concerning non-competes and the enforceability of non-competes expressly borrowing from wage and hour statutes about exempt employees. And some of it is a little bit more latent or a little bit more subtle, where it's just borrowing language or borrowing concepts. But either way, the overlap is there. And so what does that mean from a wage and hour perspective to get to Carrie's question? Um, first and foremost, what, what it means, and I think one of the most obvious, ones, obvious points from where I'm sitting is that you know, filing an action to enforce a non-compete against an employee or a former employee um, can call into question the exempt status of that individual as well as other individuals. Um, you know, in a non-compete case in one of these states that we're talking about or that we've, we've gone through, you know, proving an employee's exempt status or something that looks like their exempt status, proving the importance of the duties they performed or the professional nature of their job or the executive nature of their job or the administrative nature of their job is essentially an element of the claim when, when you're moving to enforce this, this non-compete. And it's gonna be fought, usually. You know, it, it, you're gonna get pushback with an employee saying, well, no, that, that wasn't me, unless they can't do it and pass the bus test at the same time. And that sort of fight has the potential to lead to one of the most prevalent and expensive types of, of employment litigation there is right now, which is a wage and hour claim. If you think about, just as an example, um, you know, say you're, you're, you're moving to enforce a non-compete against an account manager. You know, account managers, they, you know, what they do differs from business to business, but it's nevertheless a title that comes up a lot in wage and hour litigation. Uh, oftentimes with questions about whether an account manager for a given business is performing duties that, that, that uh, qualify for an exemption of any sort. And the answer cuts both ways. You know, the answer is not determined by, by, by job title, it's determined by what that person does. But, but say you're moving to enforce against an account manager. You know, if that account manager has, has a, a, a lawyer who's plugged in with the rest of the plaintiff's bar, they might, it's not hard to imagine a circumstance in which in the context of saying, well, this account manager didn't perform the duties that fit within the state non-compete statute, it's not hard to imagine that same attorney realizing or making the connection with someone else, you know, some other member of this growing wage and hour bar on the plaintiff's side of, of, of the bar to say, hey, I've got an account manager who was classified as exempt and we're fighting it here in the restrictive covenant context. If there's one account manager, there's probably more. You know, most companies, especially companies that are uh, in, in multiple states, that's the type of position where you could have multiple people. And so all of a sudden you're, you're, you're kind of walking into these risks, if, trying to enforce a non-compete, but walking into risks of perhaps a wage an hour, single plaintiff or a class or collective action. Um, likewise, you know, other points I'd mentioned, filing a non-compete uh, action, an action to enforce a non-compete agreement presents the same sorts of risks if you do so against an independent contractor. You know, as Dan mentioned, there are some states that expressly allow a, 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 a business or a putative employer to enter into a non-compete with an independent contractor. Other states or other state courts take a dimmer view of doing that. But nevertheless, when you get into that sort of fight with an independent contractor, again, you're walking into these, these potential risks that, that, that could lead to other types of litigation about was that person classified properly? You know, should they have been an employee? If they should have been an employee, should they have been exempt and, and not entitled to overtime or non-exempt and entitled to overtime? And so that's another risk that, that, that can come out of it. And then the last thing I'd mention is that um, you, certainly you, you could imagine 
the, the same sorts of risks, but in, re in reverse. You, you could imagine, you know, an account man manager collective action where a crafty plaintiff's attorney realizes that, you know, a big core of a company's account managers are in a certain state, and in, in, in that certain state, perhaps what these folks are doing would would mean that the employer cannot enter into a restrictive covenant or a non-compete agreement with those individuals. And so certainly you can imagine the, the, the circumstance in which non-compete litigation leads to wage and hour litigation, just as possible, or you, you could at least conceive of, of the same in reverse, of wage and hour cases leading to actions to maybe invalidate a restrictive covenant agreement or something like that. Got it. So both of y'all throughout this presentation have, have mentioned independent contractor a couple of times. And not only is that a, a big area of risk, but it's also making the news um, seemingly more and more frequently. Kevin, can you tell us a little bit about how independent contractors might play into this analysis? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's a really timely question. Um, it's the same sort of risk, right? So, so if you're bringing an action to enforce a non-compete against an independent contractor, you are potentially leading to sub fights, to sub disputes within that 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 context about well, was this person properly classified or not um, as an independent contractor, or should they have been an employee? You're kind of opening up the can of worms to examine the appropriateness of the classification that you, the business, went with. That fight is especially um, it, 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 it's brewing and getting hotter right now. Um, the Biden administration and, and its Department of Labor looks very similar to the Obama administration's Department of Labor, where independent contractor classification was a very, uh, very distinct focus. And, and, and to be even more particular about it, you know, this new administration is going to have a narrower view about who can properly be classified as an independent contractor rather than an employee. It's, it's, it's an area where we know the new administration is focused. They came in and almost on day one rescinded a rule that was proposed by the prior administration about the definition of, of independent contractors, that the prior administration's rule would have been more business friendly than what's likely to come out of the Biden administration. And, and going a step further, the deputy administrator at the Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division, so the division that's, that's tasked with enforcing, among other laws, the federal wage and hour law, her name is Jessica Lumen, and she's on the record. She, you could Google it and find it, is saying independent contractor misclassification issues are, quote, one of the most serious issues facing workers. It's absolutely a focus for this administration, and it's likely to be, be brought even more sharply into focus in, in, in the year to come. Uh, Dan, I know there's, there's also some even more distinct overlap between that focus on independent contractors and also on, on you know, other points this new administration might focus on for non-compete. So if you want to talk about that, I think it'd be a good time to do it. Yeah, sure. I think that the Biden administration's concern about workers being class of misclassified as independent contractors uh, is part of an overall concern about um, uh, various practices that they believe are uh, causing the wages of workers to be uh, artificially lowered and are keeping workers from being able to move from, from job to job for, for higher opportunities. You know, whether that's actually the case, I, I think is, is maybe open to debate, but that certainly is the policy concern. And non-competes and non-poaching agreements, which is you know an agreement that you're not gonna hire you know, a competitors uh, or some, some other entities employees, which raises antitrust issues, which, which we can't talk about today. It has been a big focus of the Biden administration, along with this idea of independent contractor classification. During the campaign, the Biden administration uh, issued a, a plan called Plan for Strengthening Worker Organizing, Collective Bargaining, and Unions. And part of that plan was a pledge to eliminate non-competes for any low-wage workers. In that uh, Specifically, the language which I'll quote here is that the, the Biden team would eliminate non-compete clauses and no poaching agreements that hinder the ability of employees to seek higher wages, better benefits, and working conditions by changing employers. Um, President Biden will work with Congress to eliminate all non-compete agreements except the very few that are absolutely necessary to protect a narrowly defined category of trade secrets – 
and outright ban all non-poaching agreements. So, you know, pretty broad promise there. Uh, you know, ban on all non-compete agreements except in these very limited circumstances. I don't believe any bill has been introduced so far in this Congress to ban non-competes. Uh, but I, I think this is an area, as the Biden administration signaled, that that they're focused on. And it's also an area that that really could be a, a, a an area of bipartisan cooperation. In 2019, Senator Rubio, Republican from Florida, introduced a ban called the Freedom to Compete Act. That bill would have amended the FLSA to ban non-compete agreements except for employees who are exempt under the FLSA. And so at the federal level, would it would do what Massachusetts and, and some other states are doing at the state level of tying FLSA exemption uh, to non-competes. I don't believe Senator Rubio has reintroduced that bill yet in this Congress. Um, if, if I'm wrong on that, someone please correct me. But I think it signals the kind of approach that Congress might take uh, in the relatively near future if there's enough support that starts to, 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 to well up for banning non-competes at the federal level, except with respect to uh, certain kinds of employees. Got it. Uh, next next slide, please. So we just went over the risk. Seems like there are some major pratfalls to watch out for. Um, to, to both of you and Kevin, I'll start with you. How do companies manage the risk that we just start, we uh, we just discussed? Yeah, it's a good question. I, mean, I, I think you know it, at a very high level, I think you know being proactive, thinking about these things ahead of time is 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 the way to go. But that obviously doesn't answer the question about what to do. And so, you know, one thing, particularly on the wage and hour front, and, and managing those risks, we've heard and, and and seen a lot of employers consider arbitration agreements. Um, you know, an agreement where an employee says, I agree to bring any dispute I have with you on this certain type of claim in arbitration on a single claimant basis rather than in court and on a, and on a class and collective action basis. There are pros and cons to that and discussing the pros and cons to that could honestly be its own presentation or probably like four or five presentations, but just a few things I, I, I'd note right up front. Um, you know, on the one hand, I'd say that you know, in most states and with most claims, you could set out an arbitration agreement where you specifically limit uh, your exposure to class and collective action claims involving wage and hour issues through an arbitration agreement. So you can specifically target these types of claims. Um, and a lot of employers recently, I think, have taken to implementing or at least considering these types of agreements, these types of agreements where you, you say, yes, we're going to arbitrate. We're going to focus it on wage and hour claims. I think that focus has been due to a whole multitude of reasons from varying state laws that might limit the types of claims that can be forced to arbitration um, to you know, even something that's more soft in, in nature, you know, and not a law in the books, but something that's no less important. You know, an example, I think, you know, I think amidst the, the Me Too movement, I think a lot of employers have stepped back and said, well, you know, we don't want to push. Uh, harassment claims, sexual harassment claims into arbitration, even if we could. We want someone to be able to have their claim see the light of day on that sort of thing. So there's all sorts of reasons you might limit an arbitration program to wage an hour, but it's certainly something that some employers have done and you can do so effectively in a lot of places. That said, you know, those sorts of agreements aren't without risk. Um, it is, it, it's certainly not a, a silver bullet against facing claims. Um, I think for a lot of plaintiff's attorneys, they can cause the attorneys to think twice before they spend a lot of time and resources trying to identify that they have one claim off through the door. How much time are they going to try to spend finding someone else who looks the same way and the next person, the next person? I think that, that you know, it, it, it can cause some attorneys to, to stand down on those types of efforts, but not all. You know, we, we've seen a lot of plaintiff's attorneys enhance their resources and become a lot more sophisticated and filing, you know, 50 arbitrations in a week. And that certainly can lead in some instances to that, you know, the, the, the be careful what you ask for type of problem, because arbitration, maybe one of them isn't as expensive as, as court proceedings, but 50 of them can be. And so it, it, it's not a panacea, it's not a silver bullet, but it can be a good option. 
Um, Let, yeah, and yeah, if, I could, if I could step in there, Kevin, um, th this is another one of those areas where I think that the, the risk from a wage and hour perspective and the risk from a um, restricted covenants perspective is different and you know, companies should keep both in mind. You know, for all the reasons that arbitration provisions are great from a restricted covenant, sorry, from a wage and hour perspective, they're not great from a, a restricted covenant perspective. I personally, I don't think that arbitration is a great venue for um, for litigating restricted covenant claims. And so, one thing to keep in mind is you could have a, an arbitration agreement that applies to wage and hour claims, like Kevin mentioned. But make sure you've carved out at least the ability to seek injunctive relief on a preliminary injunction basis or TRO basis in your agreement. I think that's probably allowed anyway under the Federal Arbitration Act of injunction in aid of arbitration. But you might even consider um, carving out any restricted covenant claims, whether it's non compete or trade secret misappropriation claims from arbitration uh, altogether so that those claims will proceed uh, in court separately from any kind of wage and hour claims that would proceed in arbitration. And, and, and then Carrie, if I could, I, I, I'll offer one more thing, you know, in addition to, to looking at arbitration agreements, as Dan mentioned, you know, maybe thinking about including wage and hour claims, at least giving that some thought, but ensuring that you keep all your rights and ability to enforce restrictive covenants as you need to. Another proactive step is making sure that you're on top of the classification of your exempt employees. Um, easier said than done, but at a minimum, what I would say is that it, 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 if you haven't looked at your exempt classification recently, or if you haven't done so regularly, at a minimum, what I, what I would advise is partnering with legal counsel of your choice, whoever it may be, but to at least look at a high level at your exempt population to identify and at least triage potential risks risk jobs. So that could be as simple as pulling together your exempt titles, making sure that you've got, you know, what their titles are, how big are the jobs, how many people are in them, uh, what states are they in, you know, are they in high risk states like California or Colorado? Um, and then also looking at salary ranges, you know, what's the minimum salary, what's the maximum salary uh, for those individuals, as well as job descriptions. Those things right there, they're not going to tell you as someone definitely exempt or definitely not. But with that sort of information, any counselor who's experienced in the area can usually help you to triage to say, look, don't need to worry about those so much. They're going to pass muster pretty much any day of the week, but these ones are closer calls. And so at least doing that sort of thing on a regular basis, I think is very important. And I know we're pressed for time, but the, the one thing I would say, I think the need to do that is even more important after the year that we've had. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of jobs have changed. Uh, I think very few industries are immune from that. And the, the most specific example I could think of is this. This is one of the things that keeps me up at night um, because I'm a wage and hour nerd and wage and hour things keep me up at night. Um, if you think about an outside salesperson, an outside salesperson who is out calling on, on customers, going to customers, places of business to sell, usually can be exempt. I mean, it, it, and I'll take the usually out. If that's their job, if that's what they're doing, under the federal law, that's going to be fair to classify as an exempt employee. Well, you know, we've started to hear bits and pieces of, well, you know, this outside salesperson realized during the pandemic that they could sell just as effectively from home. You know, they don't need to go to the, to the customer's place of business. They had their best year or barely any drop off selling, you know, selling from their living room. If that becomes the new norm, then all of a sudden you have these classification issues because the law is pretty clear that inside your home is not outside. And so those sorts of things, I, I think, but just as a matter of good practice and also as a result of change that you might have uh, undergone over the last year, really good idea to make sure that you're looking at your exempt classification. You know, and that's a great exercise that if you are already have a non-compete program or you're rolling out non-competes, you could save some time and, and effort by rolling into that analysis of, of the classifications an overall view of what kind of employees you're having sign non-competes. You're already doing the work to sort of figure out what the what, what your workforce looks like, what their job duties are, if they can properly be classified as exempt. You might then um, base what kind of employees you want to have bound by non-competes in part uh, based on that analysis. 
Um, so you're getting some efficiencies of, of looking at both of those issues at the same time. Got it. OK, well, gentlemen, uh, let's go to the last slide, please. So I'm surprised that that moved uh, so quickly. An hour went as, about as fast as it possibly could. Um, if you have questions stemming from today, our, our contact information is on this last slide, and we, we'd be glad to discuss them with you. Um, otherwise, Dan, Kevin, thank you so much for your thoughts today. Um, I thought this was a, an excellent presentation, and I'm glad we've been a part of it. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks so much.